Good evening, and welcome to Georgia Southwestern State University. I'm Professor Bonnie Levine Berggren, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's Global South Lecture. This lecture series is named after and endowed by the late Professor Emeritus Harold Isaacs, who served as a history professor at Georgia Southwestern for 49 years. During his tenure at GSW, Professor Isaacs taught courses in Latin American history, African American history, and established minors in Black Studies and Third World Studies. In 1981, he launched the Third World in Perspective seminar series, and two years later, he established the Association of Third World Studies. In 1984, the Journal of Third World Studies followed. This journal addressed the problems and issues facing the less developed countries all over the world. Following Professor Isaac's death in 2015, the name of the journal was changed to the Journal of Global South Studies and is published by the University of Florida on behalf of the now named Association of Global South Studies. As part of his bequest to GSW, Professor Isaacs requested that part of the monies be used each semester to bring a guest speaker to campus to talk to the campus community about issues and opportunities that face the Global South. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Phil Smedra. Dr. Smedra is currently an associate teaching professor at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. He is also a professor emeritus here at Georgia Southwestern State University, where he taught economics from 2001 to 2019. Dr. Smedra holds a bachelor's degree from Penn State University and both a master's and a doctorate in agricultural economics from the University of Georgia. He worked as an economic analyst for the United States Department of Agriculture, volunteered in the Peace Corps to work in the Ministry of Agriculture in Morocco, and subsequently served as a senior lecturer at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. He also served as a visiting professor at the American University in Bulgaria. While at GSW, Dr. Smedra was the director of our study abroad program, and he has traveled extensively throughout the world, visiting over 60 countries. He arranged for and accompanied students on 16 study abroad programs on multiple continents. While living in Fiji, Dr. Smedra began looking at public health issues facing Pacific Islanders, which will be the basis of his talk this evening. He is also beginning a research project through Gannon University and Catholic Charities, looking at refugee resettlement in the Erie, Pennsylvania area and how they are able to adapt to a new culture. After Dr. Smedra concludes his presentation, you will be able to ask him some questions. We welcome our colleague and our friend, Dr. Smedra. <clears throat> what a great pleasure it is to be back in Americas. It's been, I was here last year. Uh, There's a, apparently a beer festival in April. And so my wife and I came uh, back to Americas and uh, it was cold and rainy, 45 degrees and cold rain. And uh, so I'm happy to be here when it's like 75 degrees and sunny. And uh, when in Erie, Pennsylvania, it's still winter and will continue to be winter until probably May. Um, so this is a nice little respite uh, instead of coming to or going to the Bahamas or, you know, I've come to America's Georgia. And I don't need to use the, you know, my Google Maps. I know my way around, except for the, you know, the, the cut in Lee Street where you have to kind of go around that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Bonnie Levine Bergeron for uh, inviting me uh, to come and talk. Uh, and uh, continuing Dr. Isaac's legacy. Harry Isaacs was a friend of mine. Uh, we, uh, he asked me to speak on multiple occasions. Uh, it was kind of a running joke between us. I think we counted 14 or 15 different times that he asked me to speak about stuff that uh, I was working on stuff that I was doing, uh, 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 especially after uh, coming to GSW and um, 
beginning my work on public health in the developing world. And as Dr. Levine Bergeron mentioned, my work has been focused on the Pacific. And uh, all, of, all of you know about the Hawaiian Islands, uh, the, uh, the 50th state, and that's not really the Pacific. The Pacific, the developing Pacific, are islands like this. This is an island called Funafuti, which is the capital island of the Pacific Island nation of Tuvalu. There are about 12,000 people that live uh, in Tuvalu, a series of uh, little atolls uh, that are spread out over hundreds of square miles in the Pacific. About 7,000 people live here on Funafuti. And one of the issues, public health issues in the Pacific has been uh, diabetes. It is killing the people of the South Pacific. Uh, about 30% of the population of Funafuti is diabetic. There are places, and I'll talk about them in my presentation here, that have much higher incidences of diabetes. In the United States, about um, 12 to 13 percent of the adult population of the, uh, of the U.S. is diabetic. There are some countries in the Pacific where 40 to 45 percent of the population is diabetic. And diabetes is it's managed in the United States very well. You know, everybody's got a clinic to go to or, you know, if you're if there's a diabetic emergency, you can go to the emergency room in the developing world. That's not the case. And so if, in fact, you develop uh, a non-communicable disease, and that's what I'll be talking about, diabetes is a non-communicable disease, meaning you can't catch it from somebody as you can typhoid or cholera or tuberculosis. Those are communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases are rampant through the developing world. Um, my notes here tell me that uh, I, what I want to do, what I want to do, should I, you can, I'd have to project uh, loudly here, and I will, I'll project. Um, I need to make this presentation compelling to you, the young people in the audience who probably haven't traveled at all. And, you know, I don't know how to do that with a PowerPoint presentation. The only way that this is, becomes compelling to you is if you actually go to the developing world. And so uh, Dr. Levine Bergeron mentioned that I was the study abroad director here uh, for, from 2003 to 2019, that's 16 years. And in that time, she also mentioned that I took, uh, along with other faculty uh, students, uh, on study abroad. Um, if you get a chance, and you have a chance here at GSW, uh, go on a study abroad trip, and not to Paris or to Rome, you eventually will get to Paris and to Rome. Go to a developing country and see how people live their lives. That's the way this becomes compelling or will become compelling to you. If you actually live in a country you know, I asked my Gannon students whether they ever have heard of the U.S. Peace Corps. How many of you students have heard of the U.S. Peace Corps? More than uh, at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. The Peace Corps was established in 1961 by President John Kennedy. And since then, over the past 60 years, uh, about 250,000 volunteers have gone off to developing countries. Uh, my own experience was in Morocco, working in the Ministry of Agriculture. You have to uh, go on study abroad, but more importantly, if you have the opportunity, live in a developing country, then you become empathetic to the people who you share this planet with. You know, about 8 billion people total on this planet, 7 eighths of them live in a developing country. And their lives are totally different than uh, the lives that you're experiencing here in the United States. Go on study abroad, go on a, 
a Fuller Center for Housing build. You know, they have, uh, we, we, GSW has had a, a connection with the Fuller Center for a good many years, originally with the Habitat for Humanity and the Fuller Center. And, uh, you know, Dr. Robinson and I went to Romania uh, one year, a good long time ago. Uh, we went to El Salvador uh, with another uh, group of individuals to help build houses. Do that in order to understand uh, what life is like in the developing world. There's no way that somebody could come up in front of you with a pretty PowerPoint presentation and convince you that, uh, that you should have a bit of compassion for people living uh, in the developing world. So I've been concerned about folks in the developing world since Morocco, and that was 30 years ago. And uh, I've been doing research on countries and individuals, public health, since living in Fiji. And that was 20 something years ago, 23, 24, 25 years ago. Uh, and that's what it takes in order to uh, develop compassion, uh, a willingness to attempt to help the situation of those individuals. So what I'm going to do is talk about uh, uh, public health situation in the Pacific Islands. And then I will talk to you about a project that I started here uh, in 2013, which is getting to be a few years ago now. And it lasted for a couple of years. It was funded with a grant of $65,000 from the International Diabetes Federation. And uh, we attempted to improve diabetes education, you know, telling people, because in the United States, people who are diabetic, again, have access to all kinds of assistance. They know that they need to, uh, you know, they, they'll watch their blood sugars and they can take pinpricks and uh, measure their blood sugar every morning to determine how much uh, uh, medication to take in order to control blood sugars. But people in the developing world don't. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue about what causes diabetes, and they don't have a clue about how to manage diabetes. They come to a clinic usually every week to have their uh, blood sugar tested and their blood pressure taken and talk to a nurse. So education uh, in the developing world is lacking. Public health education is lacking. And so that's what this project was about, to improve public health education through community theater. And most of the people in the Pacific, uh, you know, they, they don't read brochures that the Ministry of Health puts out. They don't uh, look at posters or read posters. Or they're, they're kind of designs on the walls, but that's about it. So people in the Pacific and a lot of people in the developing world are open to theater or music or dance. And if you can get a point across about public health through one of those mediums, then uh, people understand uh, what the situation is how, and how to better control their diabetes or their high blood pressure or uh, their heart disease. Turn this on. So about 85% 85, 85 of premature deaths from these what are called non-communicable diseases, meaning you can't catch these from somebody else, heart disease, cancer, respiratory disease, diabetes, uh, non-communicable disease, diseases. 85% happen in middle-income countries. Uh, the World Bank classifies low-income countries as per capita income of less than $1,000. So people making $3 a day or trying to live on $3 a day. Middle income, $1,000 to $4,000. Uh, so a great deal of uh, mortality and morbidity occurs in these countries from these non-communicable diseases. And the reason for that is there is what is called a mortality transition. So people begin to sick, become sick and die from the same kinds of things that people in the developed world fall sick and die from. Heart disease is the biggest killer in the United States. 
you know, people having heart attacks, cancer, uh, uh, again, diabetes. In the United States, about 40 million people are diabetic. So that's what's happened. There's been a change in lifestyle, and that makes it very, very difficult to deal with these kinds of illnesses. You're attempting to convince people to change a lifestyle. You know, they've, exper they've experienced um, living in a developing country, sometimes not enough food, sometimes uh, the water that they're drinking is polluted and they fall sick from, uh, from that or uh, other kinds of illnesses associated with food and water and uh, the kinds of things that they're taking in. And as they become more wealthy, uh, as their incomes increase, they begin to eat and drink uh, the kinds of things that we eat and drink. Uh, fast food places in the developing world, even in um, Funafuti, even in Fiji, in the principal islands of Fiji, there are McDonald's, there's Pizza Huts, there's uh, KFC. Uh, they're all over the world. And people now, because they have a little bit more money, are buying those things rather than the traditional food that they grew up on, if you will. That's all they could afford. You know, there's fish uh, available. All you have to do is go out in a boat and, and catch them. Uh, there is taro, which is a root crop, kind of their potato. There is cassava, again, a root crop, which is, uh, again, has the consistency of potatoes. So non-communicable diseases have reached epic proportions in the developing world. And here's some numbers. Uh, this fellow is uh, on uh, Tarawa, which is the capital island of the island nation of Kiribati, which used to be called the Gilbert Islands until the British uh, granted them independence in 1975. And the people on Tarawa, you can see cardiovascular disease affects 30% of the women on Kiribati. T-I is spelled, is pronounced S in the I Kiribati language. 40% of the adult population of Nauru is diabetic. Uh, again, I've traveled throughout this region. If you visit Nauru, it's very difficult to get to, but there's one flight a week from Fiji. Uh, if, you go, if you go to Nauru, you can see the, uh, people walking around, they look sick, and they are. Great majority of them are diabetic, and all the complications that comes with diabetes. You see many people who have had feet and legs amputated. If you're diabetic, many diabetics suffer from what's called neuropathy, meaning they lo lose the sensation of uh, feeling in their feet. And many people on these islands walk barefoot. And so if you cut your foot on, on you know, a sharp stone or a piece of glass, uh, they don't feel it. And uh, it's very easy for infection to set in uh, once the skin is opened. And once that infection set, sets in, gangrene, gangrene becomes uh, an issue. And uh, again, typically uh, the solution for gangrene is an amputation. So if you travel to Fiji, you see lots of people who are uh, amputees, people in wheelchairs who've lost legs because of uh, gangrene as a result of diabetes. In Fiji, again, where I spent four years, you can see over the past 30 years the incidence of diabetes and how it's increased. It's something that the uh, Ministry of Health in uh, Fiji uh, doesn't have a clue on how to combat. And the problem in the developing world is most of these countries' governments pay for health care. You know, it's a single-payer system. The government pays for all the medication. It pays for the, the doctors and the nursing staff that these people go to. And uh, that's very expensive. It becomes very expensive. And sometimes governments run out of money, which means that uh, the medication that the diabetics uh, have to be taking when their blood sugar levels increase is not available. So people die. Again, what I'm trying to do is generate a bit of empathy for people in the developing world. You can see the incidence of diabetes in Fiji has increased from 6% to about 30% currently. Fijian warrior. These folks were fierce 
warriors. This is a picture from about the 1870s. Again, the, uh, the British colonized Fiji and, uh, around that time. And these were the individuals that they encountered. They're one of the fiercest warriors in the Pacific. And the Pacific Islands are noted for, you know, the wars that they had, the Tongans versus the, excuse me, let me just take a, a bit of what I call water. It's kind of ironic that I'm talking about diabetes, drinking mellow yellow. The Tongans are fierce, were fierce warriors. Uh, the, uh, the Fijians were fierce warriors. The Samoans fierce warriors, and they would fight uh, because the islands, those islands are very close together and they would fight for property. As you can imagine, you know, if you're living on a small island, then more land is pretty uh, attractive and that's what uh, these folks used to fight over. Here's a, a Fijian warrior in, again, about 1870. And here, unfortunately, is what the population looks like uh, now. This is a Samoan individual who's eating traditional food. He has taro on his plate. Uh, and uh, again, if you go to Samoa, if you go to Fiji, if you go to Tonga, uh, uh, you'll see people that are very, very heavy. And the reason for that, besides uh, the diet change, you know, moving into fast food rather than traditional diets, is because in the Pacific, well, let me go back. There is a theory that uh, the people who inhabited these islands, they came from Asia. That's not a theory. People, uh, anthropologists know that the people that populated all of these Pacific islands came from Asia through Papua New Guinea and then uh, into canoes in these long uh, voyages of exploration. And the people that survived those long voyages, sometimes months at a time, were people who could store fat. So the ones that survived had what is called a thrifty fat storing gene. And, you know, when they were warriors, when they were out uh, uh, cultivating taro and cassava, when they were working, uh, uh, being heavy wasn't a problem. It, uh, pe people weren't heavy. They were burning off what they were eating. But now that the society has become sedate, People have become heavy. And again, the, the toll of diabetes, of diabetes is, is pretty significant. Non-communicable diseases kill about 41 million people all over the world. And uh, the World Health Organization has estimated that the cost globally to both the developed and the developing world is about 47, has been, will be, uh, $47 trillion between 2010 and 2030. The gross domestic product of the United States is about $30 trillion right now. So there's a cost in, in uh, uh, human productivity. Uh, when you lose people in their most productive uh, years, uh, that's a, that takes a toll on the ability of a developing country to develop. When you're losing uh, young, relatively young people in their prime working ages. And COVID, uh, while we were involved in COVID, you continuously heard that the people who should get vaccinated are the people who are immunocompromised. And the people who are immunocompromised were the people with uh, non-communicable diseases, heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer, those are the people that needed to be um, vaccinated. Uh, treating NCDs is an issue of fairness and equity. Uh, those individuals deserve um, uh, the, the best treatment that the world has, and unfortunately, they're not getting it. Again, premature deaths impact the ability of a developing country to grow. Uh, and many people, uh, you know, leave this earth with one of these illnesses in their prime working years. 
And that holds back the ability of a country to grow. Also, people fall ill um, earlier from these illnesses than people in the developed world, which again causes uh, the ability of a country to, uh, to grow its economy because you're losing, again, uh, a great many people in their prime earning and prime productivity years. The government can do something about this. You can put taxes on cigarettes, you know, tobacco associated with all kinds of respiratory illnesses, lung cancer, emphysema. Uh, so the government could make cigarettes more expensive. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I, I, here, I remember when I lived in Morocco, uh, I was on a train going from the Rabat, the capital where I lived, I worked for the Ministry of, of Agriculture, to Marrakesh, which is about a four hour train, train ride. And I was in a compartment uh, that said, you know, I had a big non-smoking sign on it, you know, cigarette with a slash through it. But everybody, all the other five people in the compartment were smoking. And, you know, I, I talked to a couple of those folks, uh, all men, and asked them, you know, you've got a sign up there in French. You've got a sign up here that says no smoking. Why are you guys smoking? And, you know, rather than beat me up, they explained why they were smoking. A uh, pack of cigarettes in, in Morocco at that time cost 10 cents, the equivalent of 10 cents. And those of you who have ever tried smoking a cigarette, Thank goodness that only about 14% of the population of, of the United States now smokes. Hopefully none of you uh, smoke cigarettes. But nicotine is the most addictive drug that is known to humankind. So it's very difficult to uh, quit smoking. So this fellow told me, you know, for 10 cents a pack, we can remove ourselves. You know, narcotic gives you, uh, uh, nicotine gives you a bit of a narcotic high when you first start smoking and you rely on that. And he told me that, you know, we smoke because we want to remove ourselves for just a, a little bit of time from the life that we're experiencing here in this poor country. And, you know, how do you come back from that? You know, what's the comeback to this person? Stop smoking because I'm breathing your secondhand smoke. Uh, so, you know, I understood. But smoking is a killer. Uh, governments could increase the price of the tax that they levy on cigarettes, but they don't do it because people are addicted. It's a way to remove yourself. It's just like any drug. It's a way to remove yourself from where you are and hopefully move to a better place. Uh, better information, uh, restrictions on marketing sales of harmful products, uh, that typically doesn't happen. Um, There is a global fund for communicable disease. So there's a lot of money available to deal with typhoid, cholera, tuberculosis, things that are catchy that you can catch from somebody else. But only about 7% of the total available health assistance, cash assistance, goes towards non-communicable diseases. So it's the poorest and the individuals are least able to escape their situation that are most impacted by uh, NCDs. And again, from a global perspective, those are the individuals that need information, that need help, uh, that resources should be directed toward. And unfortunately, they're not. Uh, these are folks living in uh, sewer pipes in uh, Manila, uh, the Philippines. Rich countries, death from heart disease has decreased, which is a good thing, because we know the things that cause heart disease, typically. Uh, but in the developed world, uh, uh, the rate of uh, uh, mortality from heart disease has increased. And in the developing world, again, they have a double burden. They, they're still infectious diseases that are, that are rampant, depending on which part of the world you're talking about. And now, Non-communicable diseases are tremendously important, and then both of them are killing individuals living in these countries. Because water is cleaner now, and there's more food available, 
the overall lifespan of individuals has increased. So in middle income countries, countries with per capita income between $1,000 and $4,000, that's lower middle income. Upper middle income is $4,000 to about $12,000. Uh, their average lifespan has increased pretty considerably because they're drinking cleaner water. They're not falling ill from those kinds of illnesses that are associated with, with polluted water. Um, even in the poorest countries, life uh, uh, longevity has increased from 47 to 60 years, which again increases the overall rate of non-communicable diseases. As you get older, um, most people get diabetes. You know, your pancreas kind of uh, begins to shut down. And so most older individuals have to take something to uh, help them uh, digest the food that uh, they're consuming. I hope this is staged. I hope that, uh, you know, uh, uh, a one-year-old or however old this kid is, is not actually smoking. But the way he's holding that cigarette kind of uh, looks like uh, he's actually smoking a cigarette. Um, 400 million Chinese men smoke, uh, which the government of China is concerned about because the government of China provides medical care. And it knows, we know, that uh, those individuals are more susceptible to respiratory illness, lung cancer, emphysema. Uh, so the government of China is concerned. But, you know, it's very difficult to take cigarettes away from people. It's impossible. People will go to the barricades in order to maintain that cheap uh, addiction to something that removes them from a life that uh, is difficult. 40% um, of Samoan men smoke cigarettes. Uh, and again, you know, information from the developed world comes to the developing world, but people don't, there's no enforcement. Uh, you know, people start lighting up in a restaurant where there's no smoking signs, nobody will say anything about that. And we, you know, we've all seen this kind of stuff, but um, obesity is this huge problem, this is called uh, metabolic disease. And it contributes to all the illnesses that I just talked about, all these non-communicable illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, some cancers. The problem in the Pacific is that uh, being heavy is something that is valued. You know, here, 80% of women in Samoa and Tonga are uh, over 35 are obese because that is perceived by males in those countries to be attractive. I'm quite sure why, but uh, so there's no incentive not to become big, which again causes uh, the lifespan of many of these individuals to be shorter than it would be. Kids uh, are becoming big. 20% of children in China uh, are considered to be obese. And that's because, you know, China was a developing country until, you know, 20 years ago, where food was not all that available. But now it is. A part of China has become prosperous, about 500 million people out of a population of about 1.3 billion people are prosperous. And the other 800 million are not, but they're aspiring to be prosperous. And so, again, the government of China sees this as a nightmare because they're the ones who are providing medical care uh, to these individuals that are setting themselves up for uh, a lifetime of chronic illness. These are rates of obesity, and these are uh, Pacific Island countries. Notice Nauru, 60% of the population is considered to be, uh, has a, a BMI body mass index of greater than 30. Uh, and they're all trending up, this is up to 19, 2016, it has increased since over the past eight years. How am I doing? Oh, good. And again, here's the problem. Governments pay for health care. So people go to clinics, they don't pay anything, and the government has having to purchase uh, these uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that are provided to individuals free of charge. And again, in some countries, some times of the year, they run out. They simply don't have the money to pay. And, you know, other 
non-governmental organizations step in, all these people, the, you know, the Doctors Without Borders or uh, uh, some other international aid organizations will come and provide those, those medications that these people need now that the government doesn't have the money to pay for them. Uh, but still, it's very costly to governments, and they're concerned about that. And another thing that is a big issue in the developing world, in the Pacific in particular, is mental health, which is considered to be uh, something that people don't talk about uh, in the Pacific. And in earlier work, um, in uh, earlier research work, my own research work in the Pacific, we were in Sa Samoa and doing... Uh, surveys of uh, people being treated for diabetes at the big hospital in Apia, which, which is the capital of Samoa. And uh, we talked to about 300 people, and 75% of those individuals admitted to me and the other enumerators that they were depressed. And if you're diabetic and you're depressed, diabetes is something that has to be managed uh, in order to conduct your life. And depression uh, decreases the ability of individuals to manage their disease. So it compounds the problem. And again, mental health is something that people in the Pacific don't talk about. So typically, economic development focuses on building, uh, building infrastructure, you know, roads, bridges, hospitals, airports. It focuses on institutional capacity. You have public servants, you know, or people working for the government. You want them to be as educated as you possibly can get them in order for the economy, uh, uh, the country to grow. Promoting good governments. You want corruption to be eliminated in the developing world. And financial integrity. You want these governments to balance their budget, not go into debt because you know, nobody's going to be buying uh, uh, Tuvalu's debt anytime soon. But a healthy population is necessary for sustainable growth. So people need to be healthy in order for the economy to grow. And they're going in the opposite direction. So here's the problem, according to me. Public health education in the Pacific, in the entire developing world, uh, is not as good as it needs to be in order to solve the problem. People aren't aware of the things that they're eating or the kind of lifestyle that they're living is contributing to their illness. Public education needs to improve. Again, I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk. You know, I, I visited many, many clinics in Fiji, in uh, Kiribati, in Samoa, in Nauru, uh, and there are posters, there are brochures that people don't look at, don't read. So how do you get the point across? How do you get people to understand that they need to change their lifestyle in order to become healthier, in order to live longer, in order to contribute to the economic development of their country? So here are some ways to do that. Number one, more physical education programs geared to adults. Usually physical education in the Pacific anyway. These are people in Samoa used to be called Western Samoa, there's American Samoa, and now this is just called Samoa. And uh, the parliament building is that big dome thing in the back, that's how I recognize this, this picture. And these folks are doing what you'd like adults to be doing, exercising. Typically physical exercise stops when people stop going to school, whether it's at the end of high school or at the end of grammar school, uh, but people begin living sedentary lives. Um, number two, public official demonstrations of healthy living. The king of Tonga, Tonga is a royalty. In the 1980s, if you, you know, Google king of Tonga, uh, uh, 1980s, uh, his grandson now I think is the king. But he weighed 200 kilograms, 440 pounds. He was the biggest monarch, biggest person in government in the world. And he decided he wanted to turn it around. Everybody else in Tonga was big also, because the king was big. And so the king thought, you know, very enlightened guy, thought that if I lose weight, the population of Tonga will lose weight. There are about 130, 140,000 people in Tonga, the archipelago of Tonga. He lost 200 pounds. 
uh, and then died at the age of like 87, I believe. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he died of. But he lost 200 pounds, 100 kilos, 220 pounds. And the population of Tonga also lost a tremendous amount of weight because the king was doing it. More public officials need to demonstrate uh, healthy lifestyles. The people in that country will emulate that individual. Sponsoring active lifestyle events. Uh, during, again, an earlier research project in Nauru. Uh, I went to uh, st uh, speak with the prime minister who was a student of mine uh, when I was uh, a lecturer at the University of the South Pacific. Uh, so I went to Nauru and we were talking about what I wanted to do on Nauru. And he invited me to, he knew I was a runner and invited me to uh, come to a foot race uh, the next day. It was Olympic day in the capital of Nauru. Uh, Nauru is a one island uh, nation. You can walk around it in four hours. It's about 12 miles around. It sits right on the equator. It was one of the richest countries in the world because it's directly on a flyway uh, where birds, seabirds would come and perch on Nauru resting on their way either south or north. And the guano that they left, you know, the bird poop, uh, built up over thousands and thousands of years. And when Nauru was first inhabited, uh, and then the British got there, that phosphate, which is what the guano uh, became, was mined. And uh, per capita income in Nauru was one of the highest in the world. And now it's, you know, over the past 30 years, uh, it's been depleted. And now Nauru is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, so he asked me to uh, compete in a foot race uh, the next morning. It was Olympic day in uh, Nauru. And 1,500 people showed up. The population of Nauru is about 12,000 total on this one island. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I asked, you know, how, how far is the race? Nobody knew how far the race was. You know, you start here and the end is some, somewhere out there. It turned out to be a five mile race, an eight kilometer race. And I came in fifth out of 1,500 people. Uh, the people that beat me were uh, uh, four Australian military uh, personnel who were based on Nauru. Everybody else was eight, nine, and 10 years old. Um, so I beat all the, uh, the children because they kind of ran out of steam after about 100 yards. Uh, but, then, you know, that kind of made me feel good that I came in fifth out of in this big, big race. That's what needs to happen. Uh, and, and community theater, which, and I'm, I'm kind of, I just need about five minutes. Um, community theater is something that gets the point across, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, was something that people are interested in. You know, they, they are into music and theater and dance. And so I thought that this would be a good thing to try to improve health education in these countries. We picked Fiji and we picked a city on the second island of Fiji, a place called Vanua Levu. And the city is called Lombasa, about 30,000 people. And we got, of course, the, uh, the um, permission of the Ministry of Health in Fiji. And over a two-year period, 2013 to 2015, we staged theater. Uh, and I don't know whether Tom DeTita is here, but he's a local playwright who wrote the plays that we staged. And every six months, uh, we would draw uh, venous blood from these people who were coming to the hospital uh, being treated for diabetes, and while they were there, they would witness these, these stage productions. And over a two-year period, here's, these are just some photos, uh, my own photos of the team that we had, and people being waiting, waiting to be treated and also waiting to be uh, interviewed and having their blood drawn. And over a two-year period, their HbA1c, you know, there's two ways to measure blood sugar. One is by pricking your finger and just, you know, dabbing a bit of uh, reagent uh, in a piece of paper on it. But this is a much more accurate way to determine blood sugar levels, uh, a venous uh, draw. 
And you can see in our intervention group that originally in 2013, the HbA1c was 13. We almost have that just by individuals being exposed to theater. We had a control group in Suva, the capital of Fiji, which was on a different island. And they had their blood drawn every six months and did not experience theater. And you can see that their HbA1c decreased marginally just a bit. But in our group, and the reason why this didn't make world news is because you can see N. Uh, we originally wanted to talk to 200 people, but we could only follow 25 over a two year period. Some people died, people didn't come regularly. So uh, the number, uh, I can't uh, infer statistical significance to a, a sample population of 25. But those 25 people that we tracked uh, had experienced a significant decrease in their HbA1c blood sugar levels just by exposure to theater. So uh, these illnesses uh, continue to be rampant. You saw the, the progression of diabetes in Fiji. Uh, uh, nobody's come up with a way except uh, theater to cause that trend to go in the opposite direction. What we needed, if I was in Fiji, uh, I would have followed up on that project. And we, I'm sure that we would have gotten the overall incidence of diabetes down uh, in these populations. These are Nauruans uh, on Nauru. Um, and, you know, my thinking is that in a generation, 20 years, that you can improve uh, public health, diabetes in these countries with better methods to educate people on how they should be living their lives. And I think that's, uh, so uh, if you're interested in the, um, the research project, the theater project uh, that was published in the International Journal of Diabetic uh, uh, Research in the Developing World, it's a Springer journal. If you go to the website up there, um, you'll, get, you'll get to the abstract and Springer, which is a uh, publisher, wants you to pay 40 bucks to actually have access to it. But if you're interested in reading um, the uh, journal article, you can send me a, uh, an email. Either, well, there's my Gannon address, my uh, GSW address, I still teach uh, online for GSW, is my first name, philip, P-H-I-L-I-P, dot, my last name, at gsw.edu. If you're interested in reading about that theater project, I'll send you the article. And I think that's it. Yeah.